Hi everyone, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. On today's video, we have a package from Phil in the UK. He's a nice man who sent me this Panasonic Tough Book. I have a feeling there'll be more Tough Book parts inside of here. Let's get right to the video. Let's take a look at what Phil has sent over. This box is not nearly as heavy as the last one I got from Phil, so I do know that there's not another Panasonic Toughbook in this box. Oh, look at this very nice, comfy bubble wrap bed in here. I do save the bubble wrap that people send me, actually, because this is useful if I'm selling stuff on eBay or shipping things elsewhere. It's always good to have this stuff on hand. FAO Mr. Black. There's a note from Phil. I'm going to skip it for now, and I'm going to open up the rest of this stuff to be surprised about what's in this box. We got a box in a box and a smaller box in a box. Let's start with this small one right here. Something that's poked its way through the side. Ooh, what is this stuff? All right, well, got a little assortment, something wrapped in paper. It looks like a PCI card of some kind and a little box. Let's dig into this stuff. Oh, okay, we got a memory module. 128 megabytes, PC100. So if I am not mistaken, this is RAM that would go inside of this tough book here. I can see right off the bat, this appears to be one of these Win TV boards capture card. Oh yes, it really is. It's a dual tuner, dual stream capture card, two Connexent capture devices here, probably for recording two things at once if you're gonna use this in a DVR functionality. So what's really cool is these cards, of course, are available here in the United States, but they do not include the PAL and CCAM tuners. And I bet you Phil sent this to me so that I can output RF from things like the Spectrum before I modified it into a card like this so I could actually tune to the RF channel that the Spectrum has. That's really handy. I hadn't really thought about that. Now, cards like this won't run on Windows 10, unfortunately, due to the drivers not being signed and all that. But with Windows XP, this card probably works absolutely flawlessly. And I recently found a computer in the e-waste at work, which I disassembled and salvaged for parts. It was a large, huge server case, so I didn't keep that. But this was the motherboard from that machine, which does work. It's a Pentium 4. Uh, I forgot the speed. Maybe it's 3 gigahertz. Has a lot of RAM, like 2 gigabytes. 64-bit PCI X slots. I think this would turn into a pretty nice Windows XP machine. And since it's ATX form factor, I can just stick it in one of the many extra cases I have up in the crawl space here in the basement. And then I'd be able to use this capture card to capture all the PAL signals I ever needed. So look, look for a Windows XP build using this Pentium 4 here in a future video, where I can test out this WinTV card and see what it's like to capture some PAL signals. All right, what's in this? This is interesting. Let's cut this open. Oh, Phil, top man. He sent me the covers for the tough book. I can't even believe it. This this guy is incredible. All right, we'll get to that in just a moment. And there was one more hiding in there as well. All right, I wonder what this little box is here. Uh, my, tu tu my Tu Toyo. I'm, I'm butchering that Japanese pronunciation. You know, I wonder if this is a replacement battery or something for this. What what did what did he send here? The, oh, oh, this has nothing to do with the tough look. This looks like um, a magnifying loop. Oh, that's exactly what this is. So it has an adjustable barrel here and a magnifying lens on the top. And then you can use this to look really closely at things and the light can pass through the clear section here. So you get some light on it and you can see what you're looking at. My father was a graphic designer and he had these. Now, I never had one of these and I've actually been meaning to pick one up because yeah, I'm getting old now. My, my birthday is coming up. So my eyesight is definitely not what it used to be, especially for close up things. You may see me using these magnifying goggles in a lot of my videos, and these things are a godsend for me. I honestly wouldn't be able to do a lot of the work I do without these. Uh, there's a link in the description if you want to pick these up. They're pretty cheap from Amazon, by the way. I just gave this a test on here, and wow, it works so well. It's optically so sharp and so clear, and I was so easily able to make out the tiny writing on these components on this dim. This I'm going to be using quite a lot. So looking at the box again, yeah, like I said, made in Japan, 10X magnification, I'm presuming, and that would be the part number. So I'll try to find a link to buy these if you're interested in getting one yourself. I don't really have a lot of experience in these, so I don't know what classifies a good one versus a bad one, but this one is incredibly sharp. 
It comes with a little one sheet that's completely in Japanese. So unfortunately, I'm going to be unable to read that. Oh, English on the back. Okay, it's just the warranty card. All right, next up, we have this larger box. As usual, Phil has done a top job packing everything. Oh boy, I can't help but notice right here, he sent me a joystick adapter for the Spectrum. That is just too much. I mentioned in my last video showing the Spectrum that I don't have a joystick adapter. And I did have some helpful information from viewers who showed me how to build my own, but I hadn't gotten around to that. And Phil went out and found one for me and has sent it. So there we have it, the DK Tronics joystick adapter, two joystick ports on the top, DB9. And we have on the back a few screws. Interesting, there's a slot in the case. I wonder if that's because maybe some versions of this adapter had an edge connector that stuck out so you could chain additional things to it. But that's it, it looks really nice. So the box says joystick interface and other fine products from DK Tronics. Spectrum dual port joystick adapter. The first port simulates six, seven, eight, nine, and zero keys. The second port simulates 31 command. It will run any software that is using those keys using the 31 IE Kempston interface. Any software you write yourself. Now I'm really not familiar with the joystick interface on the Spectrum and how it works, but I've heard a lot of people mention the Kempston interface. I think that was very common and a lot of games supported that, but I guess it's nice because this one you can either do Kempston or you can do six, seven, eight, and nine. Now I don't know if that means I can use two joysticks at once for two player games, but please put some comments down in the comment section below if you can tell me a little bit more about how this all works. And finally in the box, it looks like we have a roll of Captain tape. And it looks like right here, it says Captain on the sticker here. So this is obviously the real deal, not the fake stuff I was getting from China. Here's the stuff I got from China. And when I compare them, the color is definitely different. The real Captain tape is much darker copper color than this. I'm curious if anyone's ever done any testing between this fake clone stuff and the real Captain tape. All right, now that I've surprised myself with the contents of this, I'm gonna read the letter. Phil says, hope this package means to be well. A couple of things were expected and a couple are surprises. Yes, indeed they were. So contents, DK Tronics interface adopter looks to be new in box, although the box has seen better days. Well, he's right about that. This thing looks basically perfect. Like inside these joystick ports that face upwards, there is not a lick of dust. I'm not sure this thing's ever actually been used or maybe it was and then immediately put back in the box. But indeed, this box is taped together with clear sticky tape. In fact, you can see here inside it's yellowed and whatnot. So it is curious how that happened. I wonder if someone just always kept this inside its box and they just wanted to keep the box intact, hence all the sticky tape. But yeah, this thing looks flawless. Captain Tape, two inches wide, an invaluable resource back when I used to work in the electronics factory. And he goes on to say, often used to shield other components when using the hot air gun for rework. That's exactly what I was thinking. Really to help prevent nearby components from melting or getting desoldered as well when you're trying to take one particular component off. Okay, he says here that the tape is unbranded straight from eBay. So actually, this may not be the real thing. Does anyone know what the real thing looks like? Like, is there printing on the inside of the spool on the real Captain tape? Next up, he talks about replacement flaps for the Panasonic. I managed to find the seller that had taken these off a unit a while back, and a couple of the hinges have ill-fitting shafts, and these are placed in a bag of screws. All right, we'll check that out in a second to see if these work on the machine. 128 megs of RAM for this. He doesn't have any Mark I machines to test with, but hopefully it works, so that's awesome. The PAL Win TV capture card, so like we showed already, and then he talks about the 10X magnifier. These are super useful for those of us with older eyeballs. Well, that's definitely me. Over the years, we found they can be held either way around. Oh yeah, I see exactly what he's talking about. Actually, I can keep my head quite far away and I'm still getting a pretty good picture of like the letter E in this word here. So, okay, that's a great tip. Thank you very much, Phil. Okay, so these are the three flaps he sent along and the large one had a little bag attached to it. So I've emptied the contents and it has all these little screws and a couple shafts on it. Now, most of these have these little hinges on here and this is what attaches to the machine. So this flap, which is for the card slot, has both hinges on it, but both the larger one and the media bay one were missing one of the hinges. But inside the bag were both of the missing hinges, which are here, the two shafts that are used and then all the additional screws that are used for holding the flaps to the computer itself. Now on the media bay, I ended up taking the hinge off. So this is the other half of the hinge, which needs to mate up with one of these with the shaft in between. So I really need to see if these little metal pins will stay inside of this while it's assembled. So let's try to marry these two pieces together. See about getting this in here. So the pin is definitely inside of there. So this hinge is operational now, but the question is, 
will that pin stay inside of there or will it come out? Seems to be staying in for the most part. So let's see about attaching this back on to this large slot on the back. So I don't know, this should do the trick, I suppose. It's a little floppy compared to this one. Oh no, this one is equivalently floppy as well. So I suppose the danger is, is that if that pin falls out, it seems to be stuck in there pretty well, even though it slid in pretty easily if I'm poking it with the tweezers, it doesn't seem to be moving anywhere. Incidentally, these excellent tweezers came from a mail call video. A viewer sent these in along with some other plastic uh, pry tools. So thank you to that viewer who sent these in. I absolutely love these tweezers. These are the, the best, most fine ones I have. All right, let's do the hinge on the media bay here. What's interesting is these hinges appear to be on upside down compared to the ones on the other flap we just worked on. Notice this one is mounted upside down to this one. So hopefully this is the correct orientation. Okay, let's get this into here. Oops very fiddly work there we have it this hinge is also back together fantastic and we'll screw this down in the same exact orientation as the other flap hinge sorry hinge not flap i should probably take all these screws off and use some loctite on them just to make sure they don't fall out at some point in the future all right we have three covers to go back on the machine each one takes two screws and there's actually more screws than i need so i only need six and there's actually ten screws I think I'll put these in a little tiny Ziploc bag and store them inside the machine in case one of these other ones ever falls off a flap. I'll know where to find the spare screws. So I'm not so sure about putting these flaps back on without disassembling the computer. On this particular flap, the screw is underneath this top part of the case. And I see a seam that runs around the top. So this top part must come off and then you can easily access these screws and go straight down onto it. So I'm gonna leave this flap for later when I try to take the computer apart because I need to try to fix that speaker. Let's go on to the back flap. The back flap is easier because the screw actually goes in this way. That I can do without taking the computer apart. All right, let's give this a test. Unfortunately, these screws don't seem to be sticking to my screwdriver. My screwdriver is not very magnetic. All right, yeah, that's going in without any issue. Get that hinge into the right position. All right, is this gonna work? Look at that, it does. So this works, but I think there's another part that's missing because actually there's nothing to clip this up. And it looks like at the top right here and right here, there's something that was probably up on the computer right there and it would slot in and hook on to this little area here and here to hold the flap up. And there might've been some type of a release, like something you slid and then that would release this. I think the way this is now, yep, if you put the computer down without too much care, you might actually have this just flip down like this. See the media bay has this little thing here. I'm pretty sure that this is what was on the back of the computer for keeping that door closed. There's also one of these on the card slot cover, which was already installed on this machine. I think what I'm gonna do is actually something that's probably better than these little things, which you probably have to move simultaneously to open this. I have here a little neodymium magnet and just a standard washer. I think I'm gonna use some epoxy to glue the neodymium magnet in here, like around the serial port. And then I'm gonna put the washer on the flap here. And then when this is closed, the magnetic attraction will keep this closed. And the main reason is because I'm carrying the computer around by the handle. You can see how this is scuffed up here and here. And that's because you put this computer down on its end and this part and this part and over here as well touches the ground. And if this door is just flapping down constantly, it's gonna break it off if I put the computer down. So I do need something to hold it closed and I think this magnet should do the trick. So for testing purposes, I stuck the washer down with some double-sided adhesive and I stuck the magnet onto the case with double-sided adhesive as well. This magnet does not stick to the body of this computer since it's made out of magnesium. This works well, watch this. When I close this, it absolutely snaps closed and it holds closed with quite a bit of uh, firmness actually as well. So look at that. So that is not going to be flipping down accidentally on its own. So I just need to epoxy the magnet there and I need to epoxy the washer right there. I really feel this is better than the original latch mechanism. Just as easier to open. You could just do it with one finger like that, pop it down and then it holds it closed perfectly. Well, I think first up I need to disassemble the computer A to try to fix the speaker, but B also to get this media bay door on. So let's do this. I never found the service manual for this machine. People had sent me a bunch of links after the last video. 
but unfortunately none of the links they sent me actually had the service manual. There was just an addendum and then there was the user manual and also some setup guide or something like that. But that did not contain the information that I needed. So to pull the hard drive off, we flip this over, we pull the IDE connector off and then we lift up on the drive. Apparently inside this drive chassis is a very gushy rubbery thing. And, and look at this, this kind of gives you an idea of what the hard drive is surrounded by probably to prevent it from getting damaged when the computer gets thrown about while it's operating. For disassembly, I see there's a bunch of screws here and around here as well. And up here, there are screws inside of this. I bet if I just take those off, hopefully the top cover with the keyboard just pops right off. All right, I'm gonna flip this over. There's a bunch of screws that are still in there. They're not magnetic, so they're not easy to come out. So I don't want them to all just sort of fall on the ground. So I'm gonna use my 70s towel here to prevent them from going walkabout. All right, so the computer is definitely coming apart. The question is, which screws have to come out? There are three more screws along the top of the keyboard probably need to come out. This is where if I had the service manual, it would be so helpful. I think these back screws need to come out. I have a feeling the keyboard is a sort of a sub assembly that you need to remove first before you can take the top cover off. And it looks like I filled the screen over like this. Ah oh, yes, this trim piece here comes off. There we go, nice. Okay, at this point, it looks like the top cover is held in by the screws that also hold the screen in. All right, so it looks like I can take the keyboard out at this point. Fold that over, oh, it's a little dirty under here. And the top cover is definitely held down by the screen screws right here. So I will have to remove those. Just not something I really wanna do. I have the screen resting on that roll of Kapton tape, so it will hold it when I remove these because it will wanna just flop up. Yep, and just as I thought, see the top cover is now coming free. I definitely need to get the screen unplugged from whatever this is here. Okay, this is coming up, this cover here. However, this is... There we go. It's just held on by little clips. Great, now I can unplug the screen here. Now I have to figure out how this little thing works here. How does this work? Okay, lift up there. Hopefully this slides out. Ah, yes, there it goes. It's, it's free. There we go, everyone. All right, I can lift the screen off now. Screen is free. Okay, I have a feeling the keyboard needs to be disconnected in the same way. So we'll pop the little cover off for the keyboard. All right, and this looks like the type of connectors you slide this way. And this one probably as well. Nope, maybe not. All right, well, this one is free, whatever this cable is. So that cable came out. And then this one here, how does this work? I'm just gonna wedge that out of there. All right, there's the keyboard, it is free. Free! All right, I see how that works. You're supposed to lift that up and then you probably push it down to get it to stick. Okay, let's see if the top cover comes off now. Oh, nearly, there's something holding it on on the back here. Oh. There we go, it popped off, it was just stuck. And what is connected? Okay, there's still a little wire in here that is it's like a two pin connector of some kind. There we go. Oh, wait, there's still something else connected. Okay, there's still a ribbon cable that runs over to this little board. I'm gonna leave that connected because I don't really need to free it entirely. I just needed to move this enough so I could screw the media bay cover on. All right, let's see if I can get this thing on. There it is, there's the cover. And it's installed on there. And luckily the little latch thing is still on the top cover so this will stay closed. Fantastic. So I'm taking a look here and here's an observation. There is the coax connector on the back here. This would be for like a cellular modem. And the coax comes in and it's just cut. So this had some kind of radio in it at some point and it has been removed. 
And this cable just has a snip right there. So clearly someone has been in here and has disabled the cellular connection. So here's the IR module and there's one screw holding it in. So clearly if you're a company that didn't want infrared, like perhaps you wanted no way for the computer to be able to transfer files in and out, you could just take this module out or potentially order the computer without it altogether. So I went ahead and removed this ribbon cable. You just have to flip this little brown cover up and then that releases the cable very easily. One thing that makes me happy is looking through this board is there are no electrolytic capacitors, at least none that I can see. There are tantalums, which of course can short out, but no electrolytics means there is nothing to leak and destroy this board over time. So this ribbon cable right here is what connects to the hard drive. And there is a little two pin cable here that goes down below. And I wonder if this is for the speaker. I'm gonna try to flip this over so I can take a look at what's happening on the back side here. So this is the back of the board and actually I do see a couple electrolytic caps right there. So that's not a great sign, but I can see the red and the green wire, they are going to the speaker. So that is definitely the speaker connection. So I stuck some metal offcut leads in here to see if I can get a reading and it's open. This speaker is totally open. So I think the speaker has failed internally. All right, with a little trickery, I was able to get the speaker out. There it is. This looks like one of those typical cheap headphone speakers. Let me peel off this foam on the back. Take a look at what this speaker is. Ooh, <laughs> oh, the writing just came right off. So now I need to try to find a speaker that's the same size as this roughly and jam it in that hole. Hmm. So this is what I have speaker wise that's small, but notice none of these are even remotely small enough to compare to the one that was in this machine. Speakers this size were probably used in headphones back in the 80s and the 90s. I wouldn't be surprised if I measure the diameter and the thickness of this. I could probably go on AliExpress and order something from China. And I definitely don't feel like waiting. All right, I've cut the wires off the small speaker so I can test to see if there is any resistance across it. And there's none at all. It's completely open on the multimeter. So definitely this, this small speaker is dead. Let's test this other speaker. I'm getting 3.8 ohms on it. So yeah, that's that's kind of what you would expect, but it's working. So this little speaker that was from the computer, is definitely dead. So that has me thinking, clearly this speaker is not gonna work in the original location down under the PCB. But I see in this area here, there are two board to board interconnects. Perhaps this was the area where the cellular modem went. And it, since it's not installed right here, there's nothing in this area. Maybe there's room in here. This speaker here is quite thin, so maybe I'll just use some foam double-sided tape and just stick it in right here, and perhaps the case will close and there'll be room, so I'll at least have some sound on this machine. So I've connected this speaker to the original wire, put a little heat shrink on there, and it's just sitting here for testing purposes. I'm gonna try to power up the machine just to see if it makes any sound right now. So plug in the power supply, and here we go, let's take a listen. I heard a click. Oh, and I push, I push the power button, it beeps. Let me hold it. That's the power off sound. It works. So the problem was entirely the speaker, not a fault on the motherboard. So looking around for space, I think right in here is perfect. I am pretty sure, I am sure when if I stick this in there, it will not interfere with anything. And it just perfectly fits right in there. And there the speaker's out of the way. Yep, the speaker fits in there. Look, if I take this cover off, it's just sitting on there. The speaker's right there. It clears this part, so it sort of sits right around there. The sound will probably be a little bit muffled, but that's okay as long as you can hear the beeps because obviously I can plug an external speaker in if I wanna hear the sound a little bit better. All right, at this point, all of the covers are on, including the media bay, which is the reason why I took the lid off. So time to put this computer back together. All right, the machine is back together. Let's give this a test. First, we need to plug in the power supply. I haven't yet installed the RAM expansion, but let's turn this on first without it and see if the computer works. All right, most excellent. Unfortunately, my mic wasn't connected while recording this, so the sound is working, but you're not hearing it here. Windows 98 is playing the awesome startup sound right now, which of course you can't hear because I forgot to record the audio. Quick test of the trackpad and the keyboard show that everything is working great in Windows 98. Let's install the 128 megabyte memory module. It's very easy on the computer to do RAM upgrades. You just flip the two switches, lift the cover right off, and the memory is right there. Flip the two levers, pop out the old module, take the new module, insert it into the slot, push it down, and you're done. Just reinstall the cover and the RAM upgrade is complete. Quickly boot back into Windows 98. We'll check the RAM in there. 
And there we have it, 160 megabytes. That's because the motherboard has 32 megs installed on it, and I just installed 128 megabyte module. I can't call this complete until we run memtest86 on this machine to make sure that the newly installed RAM is working perfectly. I'm using version 4.37, and this test is very comprehensive and takes quite a long time to even run one pass. So I'm gonna let this run for several hours just to make sure everything is working perfectly. About four and a half hours later, three passes of the RAM check, no errors, so I would say this RAM upgrade was a success. Okay, it's the next day. Yesterday I used JB Weld to attach the washer and also the magnet onto the computer. This mess of tape and stuff you see here is because that little magnet, it wants to attach itself to the serial port and I had to do everything I could to try to keep it away from the serial port. So let's peel off this little bit of a mess and check out if this even worked. Okay, good. It seems to be in an okay position. Hopefully the lid's able to close. If not, I'm sure I can just break that off. So I'm gonna screw the lid back on and we're gonna test this out. Okay, moment of truth, does it work? It doesn't. Now you see how it bounces on there? That's the magnetic repulsion happening when you have the poles reversed. Not to mention that, I guess I have it too close to the edge, so I can't even close this all the way. Oh, I can't believe this. All right, well, let's see how strong JB Weld is. Well, at least that came off okay. It was on there pretty darn tight. And if I take this magnet and I stick it onto the washer, notice the JB Weld, the little remnants, is towards the washer. What a fail on my part. So I'm going to need to mix up some JB Weld and try again. Okay, try number two with the tough book. This is the mess here I did to try to get that little magnet not to move while I epoxied it. You have to get creative when you're working with neodymium magnets. Okay, so the magnet is now here in this location. It's not too close to the edge here, the outside, so that way the door can close. There should be plenty of room for the serial port so I can plug in a mouse or whatever into here. I took off the little hex nut here for the serial port. I took it off because it was so fiddly to get the magnet into place. It just gave me a little bit more space to work. Okay, let's reattach the door. All right, the moment of truth. What happens when I flip this up? Oh, okay. That's what it's supposed to do. Cool, it works just as I hoped. It's easy to pull down, stays up. I try to get the door open on oh, its own. You definitely can do it if you try hard enough. It does open. It's not quite as uh, magnetic as I hoped it would be. Ideally, I want to make sure if I put the laptop down, like, you know, treat it like a tough book, that the door stays up and it, it is indeed staying up. I mean, tough books, they're made to be treated like they're a work machine, right? This machine feels like the Timex of computers. It takes a licking and keeps on ticking. And there's sound now. Awesome. Thumbs up to a great DOS gaming machine. Well, that's gonna be it for this video. I think I can officially close the book on the Panasonic Tough Book, pun intended. I'm waiting on some parts for the ZX Spectrum Plus that Phil sent me, so I'll get to that computer, those tapes, and the joystick adapter once I get those parts in, so watch for that. And then for this video, if you liked it, hit that thumbs up button, but if you didn't, you know what to do, hit that thumbs down button. Hit subscribe if you wanna to subscribe to my channel, be notified of when I post new videos, put your comments and your suggestions in the comment section below. And that's gonna be it. Stay safe, stay healthy, and thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Bye.